A typical local curriculum guide said it more simply. Quote, human sexuality is everything a person sees as himself, end quote. If the human being is the proper domain of the sex educators, as they insist, the rest follows as the night the day. In high school, the instruction becomes even more personally engrossing. Students worked as boy-girl pairs on physiology definition sheets in which they defined foreplay, erection, ejaculation, and similar privacies. They discussed whether they were satisfied with their size of sex organs and took part in mixed group body drawing in which they drew and labeled the penis, testicles, scrotum, vagina, clitoris, vulva, labia, and so forth. They filled out questionnaires on the frequency with which they engaged in heavy petting, masturbation, and sexual intercourse. They role-played the parts of young people who have been having intercourse with each other for a long time. They practiced fitting condoms on cucumbers. College students viewed pictures of naked male and female homosexuals achieving orgasm. A female sociology professor set up an all-male focus group in which students discussed the problems of using a condom on a one-night stand. In 1998, Mindy Johnson, an instructor on human sexuality at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California, operated an erotic goods shop in Arcata. According to the campus newspaper, her shop offered dual stimulation, vibrators, erotic games, and other items designed to enhance sex. What was the reason for the unremitting invasion of students' personal privacy? Sometimes they spoke of building trust and sharing, as in the case of the body drawing exercise. Or, among other exalted purposes, they cited the intent to eliminate fears and anxieties and to, quote, enlighten a dark anti-sex dogma based on factual errors and conditions of life that no longer exist, end quote. Whatever the aims, one result is certain. If the programs work, they must break down all personal reserve on sexual matters. The authorities no longer have to worry about a populace that regards sexual activities as private. They no longer lack information touching citizens' sexual behavior, and they are no longer barred from citizens' personal counsels. As one article put it, the sex educators want nothing less than to become, quote, the best friends in the adult world that many of these students have ever had, end quote. The obvious convenience for purposes of population planning is heady incitement for power seekers. In some cases, in response to strong parental pressure, the promoters of classroom sex education have modified their programs, going so far as to include sexual abstinence as a method of preventing pregnancy. The stress on abstinence increased when Congress in 1996 authorized $50 million a year for the ensuing five years to teach abstinence. However, the sex education establishment adamantly opposes abstinence-based programs that do not teach young people to use contraceptives. When the state of Florida passed a law that established abstinence as the expected standard to be taught in public schools, Duval County Schools in Jacksonville adopted an abstinence-based curriculum produced by Teen Aid of Spokane, Washington. The legal arm of Planned Parenthood Federation of America sued the school board. Local Planned Parenthood people electioneered for liberal school board candidates and against conservatives. The assault lasted four years. Finally, in 1996, PPFA announced an, quote, outstanding end, end quote, to the struggle. The new school board had adopted an, quote, accurate, comprehensive sexuality education program for grades K through 12, end quote, that was acceptable to Planned Parenthood. Encouraged by this success, Planned Parenthood and People for the American Way launched a similar attack on the school district of Hemet, California. Again, the charge was that the school district was using an abstinent-based sex education program and was guilty of censorship in not teaching children how to contracept. The thrust remains. Overpopulation is engulfing the planet and responsible young people can respond to this threat 
by becoming more open about their sexuality and by obtaining free and confidential birth control services which are demonstrated in class from their nearby Planned Parenthood clinic whose address they learn in class. The typical local Planned Parenthood clinic advertises its community education programs including instruction in world population in its college and young adult programs and other educational venues. Despite the advertising, however, children still do not flock to the clinics, and teachers still balk at teaching sex. To this, the promoters respond with several ploys. One is to offer to teach the classes themselves with their own charts and brochures and games. Thus, it is that the typical Planned Parenthood clinic has its own staff of professional sex educators who fan out to the schools and earn a large part of the government grants flowing to the clinic. This not only brings money to the clinic but also lets the teachers off the hook and gives them free time to grade papers and prepare their other classes. In its annual report, Planned Parenthood Federation of America lists sexuality education as one of its major activities. Another strategy is to distribute condoms and other contraceptives at the school itself, either through the nurse's office or through a school health clinic. Hundreds of these clinics have now been in existence for years in cities throughout the United States. The New York City Board of Education in 1991 undertook to distribute condoms through the high schools to minor students whose parents did not want them to have the service. The action provoked a lawsuit, and the opponents amassed evidence from other cities showing that school distribution of contraceptives has not reduced pregnancy. The court decided that the schools would have to give parents the option of forbidding this service to their children. Such school clinics have proliferated in the state of Arkansas, where the colorful Dr. Jocelyn Elders served as Director of Health under then-Governor Bill Clinton. Dr. Elders was quoted as saying, quote, I tell every girl that when she goes out on a date, put a condom in her purse, end quote. Under her leadership, the state of Arkansas became a star in the sex education movement and the teenage birth rate, one of the highest among the states, increased 7%. President Clinton appointed elders as his Surgeon General, in which post she continued to speak out, supporting the legalization of drugs, among other things. I don't see a problem with that. Her remarks kept her in the news, embarrassing even the Clinton administration, which eventually dismissed her. Views on family life are a second major preoccupation of sex educators. Like Mark Twain's death, the demise of the traditional family is greatly exaggerated. Calderon and Johnson, for example, present a table showing that the so-called nuclear family has virtually disappeared. They document it by the simple expedient of categorizing married couples whose children have left home and families with resident grandparents and other relatives as non-nuclear, more similar to experimental arrangements than to traditional forms. Other programs with similar punctiliousness teach that the traditional family is disappearing. The key to the methodology is easy. Ignore facts that fail to support your theses and create others that do. The fact, for example, that more than two-thirds of all American children live with both parents is never mentioned. While this is an alarming decrease from the 85% of 1970, it is clear that the norm is still for children to live with both parents. Having established that the traditional family is a relic of history, the educators lead children to discuss their own choices among various lifestyles. Quote, intentional communities, the extended family, communes, group marriage, couples living together without marriage, single parenthood, end quote. The insistence of the United States on a variety of forms to be regarded as families was a bone of contention at the Cairo Conference on Population, as shown in the last chapter. The Sheik of Al-Azhar said, quote, Marriage between man and woman, with all its requirements and norms, constitutes the only means of making a family, end quote. In India, we have a saying, everything will be alright in the end. 
So if it is not all right, it is not yet the end.